Hey, we are live this afternoon with Robbie Schultz, and I'm super excited that you've joined me today because there's so much that we have questions about for barbecue grills. Now, it's about time that we jump into that grilling season, and Robbie has a unique experience in that he's a celebrity chef, and he owns a general store, and this is the third generation that his family has been in business, and what's really interesting is because of his recipes and because he's a celebrity chef and because he's been on the Bobby Flay show and because his recipes have been published in national magazines and news media outlets all over the globe. What we wanted to do is get him here on the show today and say, hey, listen, tell us the deets and the secrets about how to make sure that our barbecue grills are clean because you know what? Mother's Day is coming up and we know that mom's coming over and we're all going to probably have a cookout. Then we got Father's Day. We got Labor Day. We got all kinds of events coming up this season. So how do we clean our barbecue grills? Super excited that you guys are joining us today. I'm going to invite you to jump in the conversation. Ask all your questions. We're going to get them answered today from Robbie Schultz. So Robbie, how are you today? I'm super glad that you're here. Hey, Angela, thanks for having me. My uh, What an introduction. My hat is starting to tighten up. I think my head's swelling <laughs> a little bit, but thank you for that. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, um, I want to hear a little bit about your background and how you got involved in cooking and also the, uh, the grilling end of your business, because that's uh, the reason why you're here today. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, Angela, you and I talked briefly a while ago. Um, we are going into our 81st year. So there is so much to talk about. I need to ask first, how much time do I have? Because I've got 81 years to share with you. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I haven't been here that long. I took a few days off. Um, anyway, so, yeah, Bear Creek Smokehouse started out in 1943. My uh, granddad and grandmother started this farm out here that was bought by his dad. Um, back turn of the century. So, you know, the land has been in the family for a long time. And my grandparents were, you know, trying to live off the land. They, they had cattle, hogs, they had a gardens, they raised cotton, they raised corn, all these sorts of things. And, you know, coming out of the depression years and World War II, they were just having a hard time feeding their family. So they were looking at alternative means to, to have a farm income and that sort of thing. So, my granddad had an uncle out in Grapeland, Texas with an ag teacher. And he told my granddad, he said, Hick, you can put more pounds on a turkey per pound of feed fed than you can hogs and cattle. In other words, the feed conversion rate was better. So in, 19, in the summer of 1943, my um, grandfather, whose name was Hick, and my grandmother, Nellie, they got about 600 baby turkey, about, you know, just day old, that big. And um, so they started raising them. And, um, you know, they when uh, Thanksgiving rolled around, you know, they started advertising, started taking orders for turkeys, that sort of thing. And so people would come from all over Harrison County, come out here to, to pick out their turkey for Thanksgiving. And it was so funny. I remember this story, my my grandmother telling it. She said um, we even had ladies that would come out and bring their roasting pan out. And they would they would kind of be sizing up their roasting pan and looking out there in the flock of turkeys and be like, <laughs> oh, I think that one right there will fit in my pan. Could you could I have that one right there? So my granddad would go and catch it and uh, either dress it or send it home with them. And they did it themselves, you know. So it started out, you know, fresh dressed turkeys and on the foot and that sort of thing. And it wasn't they did that for a few years. And, and then in the late 40s, they finally built a little one room smokehouse and they started smoking turkeys. And, you know, the turkey is the one that brought us to the dance. We have a wide array of smoked meats and products, you know, that we sell nationwide. But um, it's still turkey that is the one that brought us to the dance. And, um, you know, we sell thousands of them during the, the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. Wow. Um, so you created then some recipes to go along with the, the products that you sell. We did, you know, and we've got them all compiled in a fabulous cookbook. I don't know if you've seen that or not, but it's called Bare Bottom Bliss, Five Generations of Food, Family and Faith. And it's got a lot of um, their, I would say, old fashioned type recipes because they came from my grandmother, great grandmother, aunts, uh, my mom, a little bit of everybody contributed to the book, just recipes that we've had on file in the family for years, you know. 
And um, so we compiled all those along with some, I, I call them tall tales from Bare Bottom, that place where we live out here on the farm, <laughs> and then some inspirational uh, words of wisdom and that sort of thing. So uh, it's a good read and it's, it's a nice coffee table book and it's got beautiful photography of the land, the lay of the land out here and, and some great recipes and food photography as well. Awesome. Now, is that book available inside your country store? It is available inside the Bear Creek General Store right here in Marshall, Texas. And it's also available online, too, on our website. Oh, awesome. OK, cool. Now, tell me a little bit about the general store. That sounds like a, a tourist trap for anybody traveling Ooh, through Marshall, Texas. You know, you know what? We, you hit the nail on the head. We've got a sign up out here on the driveway. It says finest tourist trap in Texas. And um, so we have people coming from all over. We have a world, uh, one of those flattened out world maps and we let people put pins in where they're from. We've got oh, wow. people from pretty much all continents and, you know, it's mostly U S visitors, but we, we do get a lot of foreigners that come through. So um, when you come in, you're going to get a big Texas. How do you do, you know, where you're from, you're going to get to sample all of our meats and our things that we make. Um, the store is just amazing. It's filled with antiques and um, old signs and all kinds of fabulous merchandise. You know, we um, feature all of our smoked meats along with a lot of other gourmet foods and um, gifts. We've got stuff for women, children, men, um, everybody. And um, it's, it's just a great spot. And then you go in the back and we have a, a big, huge event center where we host events. We have companies that do corporate events out here. Um, we've had some worldwide companies come and host events here when they want their guests to get the true Texas experience. Um, we've had um, people like from Russia, um, just all over the country, uh, Australia, just everywhere, you know, that are that work for these big companies and they come here. And uh, so they, they get that full Texas flavor, Angela. Well, and rumor has it that when people come to your general store, if you are on site, that you'll go out and you'll meet them personally. Is that still true? Oh, heck yeah. I'm happy to do that. Yes. We, we love people. We're passionate about what we do. And, you know, it's all about relationships. And um, when people leave our store, we want their, we just want to blow them out of the water. We want their uh, experience to be so much better than what they ever thought that, that they could um, have when they came through those red doors. Awesome. Well, I got to take a trip now down to Marshall, Texas, so that I can Come get on. a selfie taken with you. And uh... oh, we'll, we'll saddle up and we'll ride double on the Longhorn. How about that? I love that. That sounds like so much fun. Awesome. All right. Well, let's jump into our, uh, our questions. And before we do, I want to say hi to all of our guests that are here joining us today. Olivia says, love the cowboy hat, Robbie. Yes, I hi, love it too. Olivia. Thank you, baby. That is awesome. And then uh, Dixie Doodle says, Texas Hill Country, hello, good timing for the subject. Need grilling, grilling cleaning information. So, uh, yes, I'm super excited that we're doing that. And I have a couple of questions that have come in. So we want to jump into some of the questions. And one of the first questions we have says, what are the essential tools everyone should have in their grill cleaning kit? OK, so um, I've got some ideas on that that I like to share with everyone. What I like to have is like a metal, like an old metal paint bucket. It can be a gallon. It can be a five. Five gallon is actually better. And then you'd want um, to have a good grill brush, you know, a wire bristle brush. Um, you're going to want like a soft bristle brush and a spray bottle and um, maybe a sponge. Add a sponge to that. And what is inside that uh, that spray bottle? Um, you're going to have it at different times. I don't give all my secrets away now because we're going to talk about some of them later. But we're probably <laughs> going to have maybe a, a, a vinegar solution mixed up in that to do help with some cleaning in different areas. Oh, good, good, good. So a spray bottle, a sponge, and a grill brush. Is there something special about the grill brush? Well, it can be a, a wire bristle brush is what I, li I like because they're a little stiffer, a little more rigid, and um, it helps with some of that super stuck and baked on um, debris that you get on your grill grate sometimes. Awesome. Okay, cool. So let's suppose that we're pulling out the grill for the very first time and it's springtime. And if you're in North Carolina like me, there's bee pollen everywhere. What are we supposed to check for when we pull out that grill for the first time? Oh, I'm telling you. 
Angela, you could have all sorts of critters in your <laughs> grill, depending on how you stored it. Um, you know, if you have room, it's great to store a grill maybe over to the side inside your garage. So it kind of helps mm. keep the critters out. But I'm going to tell you what, when you first open that thing up in the spring, and I've had all kinds of experiences in the past, there can be wasp nests in there. There can be bees, just like you were talking about. Um, even in the stack, I've had little birds come and want to build nests in those stacks before. So those are all things that you need to be watching for. Um, the, the wasp are the worst. I've been chased away by wasp before. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I... I opened my grill, and this is last season, and a great big black garden snake slithered around the grill. And then I just, I froze for a second because I was like, that's so gross. And then I was like, do I turn it on? And then does he slither away? Do I yeah. remove him first before I turn it on? Like if I find a snake inside my grill, because I had stored my grill up against the side of the house, but I had a cover on it and he slithered right up the back. Ugh, ugh. What do I do? How do I, how do I fix that? Oh, I think you'd grab some tongs and maybe gently remove him. I'm just kidding there. No, <laughs> he'll, he'll make his own exit. But I tell you, you know, this stuff, a lot of people have grill covers, but maybe you forget to put them on. Grill covers will help a little bit, but you still have bugs that can get up in there. You can even have rats and mice um, harbored up in there for the winter, you know, trying to get out of the weather and find a warmer place, you know, out of the rain and the elements and all that kind of stuff. So there's just all kinds of stuff you got to look for. So um, when you open that uh, grill for the first time in the spring, open with caution. That's a great tip because yeah. like you said, anything can sneak up there, even if you have a grill cover on. Um, yeah. And do you, rec do you recommend a particular type of grill cover over another grill cover or does it matter? No, I don't, I don't think it matters that much. Uh, one of the main things that a, a grill cover will do, it will, it will help keep the pollen and dust out of there. Um, now, you may not be keeping all your rodents and your insects out of there, but a grill cover will help keep the grill Clean, overall clean. So speaking of cleaning, um, how do we do a deep clean versus a quick clean on the grill? And I'm guessing well, when you when you first open it for the season, you mm -hmm. should probably do a deep clean. Am I right? Well, you know what I would suggest is in late fall, I would do that. Make sure you do a deep clean. So all that um, you know, like the fat and the, the drippings and stuff that collect in the bottom of your uh, grill or smoker or whatever. So that's out of there. So that's not um, actually drawing insects and rodents in there for a source of food. I would make sure you do that in the fall before you put the grill up for the winter. You know, I think that's. Ah, uh, that might have been my problem. I might have. Had, <laughs> yeah, I might have had a food yeah. source there all winter and who knows who knows what was hiding up there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, but as far as a, a quick cleaning, I, I like to do just a, a regular cleaning every time I get through, you know, grilling something. Go ahead and clean those grates up. And then the next time when you get ready to throw something on the grill, you're not faced with a big cleaning job before. It's, it's like the Boy Scouts, be prepared, you know. Go ahead and clean that top grate a little bit, you know, after you get done cooking. And uh, I would consider doing a deep cleaning um, several times through the maybe the summer months or whatever. After you see you've got some collection of debris and fat and maybe, maybe you dropped a weenie down through the grates or something <laughs> like that when you were doing hot dogs. And, you know, be sure and grab that out of there because all that all those little food particles will attract rodents and bugs and insects and all that sort of thing. Fair enough. Is there something we can do to either line the bottom of the grill with, like put an aluminum foil down there, or is there some kind of a silicone baking liner? What, what, have, what do you do? To I never have done that, but you know, I think lining it with some aluminum foil might not be a bad idea as long as you get it underneath the burners where that foil is not interfering with the way your burners are working. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to think if there's a, an easier way to clean it up because I know if I'm out on the grill and I'm not, I, I don't know how to cook. I mean, I'm, I'm like a microwave person, right? <laughs> so Come on. when I go on, when I go out there, there are huge flames and stuff's falling through the grill <laughs> and there's all kinds of stuff. So I'm sure there's a lot of debris. I was just wondering if there's a better way to catch that. 
Yeah, no, well, uh, that would certainly catch it if you had some foil in the bottom. And, and that would ease, you would have to pull your grill grates out and it would easily be removed, you know, for sure. So speaking of grill grates, uh, Dixie Doodles says, how do you clean up the rust? All right, good question. Um, you can actually get a mixture of vinegar and um, baking soda. Just make a paste out of it. Normally you do the vinegar two parts to one part baking soda. Uh, make a paste out of it and you can put it on the grill grates and let it sit, you know, 20 or 30 minutes, something like that. And then get it out in the backyard, get a water hose and get a wire brush. And that um, the acid in that vinegar will help um, kind of pull some of that rust off of there. And uh, for those that are not familiar with the pH, the neutral pH balance of vinegar is about a 2.5, which is very close to something as strong as toilet bowl cleaner. And so we don't want to use toilet bowl cleaner, but something that's as strong in acid is vinegar. And so using the, the 2.1 dilutes that, but that it's, it's very strong. And so that will then release some of the stuff and it will eat through some of that rust and gunk that's on the, on the grill grates. That's really yes, an awesome tip. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and, um, let's see here. Something else I was going to say along that line. Um, never mind. Let's get. Let's go ahead. I'll. I'll think of it in a minute. Is it also vinegar that we would use for the uh, stubborn baked on grease and food debris? Or well, can I'll tell you the uh, for that heat is one of the best things you can do. Crank that. Crank your grill up and just fire it up, get it up to about 500 or whatever. And then once you turn open that lid, that stuff is going to be, it's pretty much going to be disintegrated. It's going to be kind of ashy. And then you can just take your grill brush and just wipe it wipe right off. So um, a lot of times that alleviates that problem just, just like that. Now uh, tell me about cooking when you're cooking on the barbecue grill. Is it possible that you are putting like um, barbecue sauce and stuff like that on the grill and that's sticking to the, the grates themselves? At the it, end of cleaning that, would you then turn the heat up and try to remove all that the same way? I, I would. That's the way I would do it. And then you're all clean and prepared for the next time. I know what I wanted to tell you a while ago. I, you know, when we were talking about um, putting the vinegar and the baking soda on, I try to at all costs avoid putting any kind of like heavy chemicals or anything like that inside your grill because uh -huh. um, I'm, ju I'm just not comfortable with it. And I'm always afraid that you're going to get that aftertaste from whatever you might have sprayed in there. But vinegar and baking soda are natural products. Um, and so that's something you can put in there with no aftertaste, no, um, and you, you won't have any problems out of it at all. Well, and that's awesome because I know that there are uh, some people, we, we won't say any names, but there are some people that have used like, uh, what do you call it? The degreaser or whatever that you use to clean the engine of a car on side their barbecue grill. And then for forever, the hamburgers and whatever taste is like yeah. <laughs> degreaser yeah. or whatever. And I'm like, ah, chemicals. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's in the back of your head and it, you just, you can't, ever, that, you, that taste will never leave your mouth once you yeah. do something that yeah awesome great points thank you for uh for mentioning that you betcha uh dixie doodle says good to know my dad's solution to every cleaning so, uh, situation and i'm guessing that is the the vinegar solution to remove the the gunk from that yeah and that's that's awesome what happens if you don't have a grill brush how do you clean the uh the grates if you don't have a grill brush well you go in your dr kitchen drawer and you get some aluminum foil out and you just get a big wad of it, wad it up, and and that will work great for um, cleaning that grill off. It'll it'll take the stuff right off. Interesting. Yeah. You well, that's it. really that's really well, awesome. I, now, is I, it, I like to have a grill brush, but that will work right there if you don't have one. And and I think if you're gonna um, grill long term. Having a grill brush is probably a tool that you will use on a regular basis. Yeah, they're inexpensive. You could probably pick one up at a dollar store or something like that. Yeah. Need well, and that was that was my next question. My next question yeah. was, do, do you prefer one brand over another, or is there any particular kind you use? Not, not particularly. Um, I like if if you're in it for the long haul. I like stuff 
with stainless handles like the tongs and all the utensils and everything. I like stainless because it's easy to clean up. It doesn't rust on you and you can, you can store them inside the house during, you know, during the winter months or whatever. Uh -huh. So if you were getting ready for, let's say a cookout this weekend, are there, uh, besides just your cleaning supplies um, and your stainless steel tongs and brush, is there anything else that you would do in preparation for that to keep your area cleaner as you're getting, as you're getting ready for grip and cook out this, this. Say, you're talking this about around the grill area. Yeah. Um, you know what it, it, if you get some little S hooks and put them on the handle, the end handles of your grill, it's kind of nice to have those to say organized during the grilling months, you can hang all your tools out there. Um, you know, earlier we mentioned the metal bucket for cleaning. You can keep, you know, all the, the like the br the scrub brush, your sponge and all that stuff in there and just kind of keep it over to the side or keep it, you know, in an out of the way place. So it's not bothering anyone or so your kids don't get in it. Um, so as far as that goes, um, you know, I think that's about it. Yeah. What about hard to reach areas of the grill? I know that when we open up our grill, there's like a little area behind the grill and it's not actually part of the grill. It's just kind of an area where stuff can fall and yeah. then it can go, get rusty and what have you if you're not like, a, I don't know, a contortionist that can get up there with. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, if you'll go to your local hardware store, you can find wire brushes in all different sizes and they come with like um, they come with brass bristles or they come with steel bristles, but they can be about the size of a toothbrush. So they're a little bit smaller so you can reach those hard to get places and scrape that out of there. And if it's if it's really, you know, you don't have a way to pick it up and get it out of there. And we're going to talk about this a little later. Um, as long as everything's cool in there, stick a shop back down in there and just remove all those little particles that you might be able to remove with a toothbrush size um, wire brush or whatever. Oh, I love that. I never thought of using a, a shop vac. Yes, ma'am. If you, if you were to go back to the tip that you gave us a, a minute ago about turning the, the temperature up to about 500 degrees and baking mm -hmm. all that stuff off, it mm -hmm. turns to ash. You could then come in yep. with the attachments on the shop vac because they come in all different size little crevice tools and things like that, that you could then get in all the hard to reach places and, and vacuum all that up. And with a shop vac, the filter is dense enough that it would allow you to collect all that without ruining a regular household vacuum. That's right. That's right. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's a great little tip. You just want to make sure that there's no live ash or anything in there when you do that, um, mm -hmm. when you use a shop vac. So make sure that everything's cool and, you know, your grill's been off for quite some time. Great point. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. Let's say the stainless steel grill, uh, grill cover, and it's become greasy or has a film on the outside of it. What do you use to clean that? The grill cover or the grill itself? The grill lid. The lid on the outside? Yeah. Okay. I would use on that because it's outside of the grill, the, the cooking cavity. I would use a little bit of Dawn. Dawn is one of the best things to clean just about. I mean, they clean baby ducks with Dawn, right? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it'll sure do you the outside of your grill, but that's what that sponge is for and your and your bucket. Use some, just some warm soapy water on the outside of that. Just be sure and rinse it off really good when you're done. Well, and Dawn dish soap is one of the things that is used. It's kind of a universal uh, degreaser. And yeah. I say universal in the European countries, it's called fairy, but it's the same kind of product and it's used just pretty much for all different kinds of things. And I also recommend that for grills because we've noticed over the years that it removes really thick gunk and is designed for pots and pans and stuff like that. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome tip on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, what would you talk about as far as cleaning the burners or the heat source on a gas grill? Well, um, so you know how stuff can leak out on the propane bottle out of the bottom of the grill and everything. It, it can get really nasty. Um, here again, I would, I would probably just unhook the, the pipeline or the connection there, take the propane bottle out in the yard and I would, I would scrub it down with Dawn really good and uh, some warm water. And, and that's going to clean that up. Now, as far as the inside, you were asking about the burners. Is that right? Yes. 
Okay, so the burners, uh, most of the time, those will remove pretty easily. You can take those out and you can take um, like a pipe cleaner or take like a paper clip and you clean all those little holes out, all the little gas ports that, you know, there's just rows of them going along there. Take yeah. that and, you know, poke all those out and make sure that they're nice and clean. Um, you know, the canned air that you get to, to like clean your keyboard off. Yes. If you want to have one of those handy, you can actually blow those things out with that, blow them off and, and make sure that, um, that, you know, that they're in good working order and that you don't have clogged gas ports and all that kind of stuff. So that's a, that's a way to tend to that right there. And I'm assuming that if you're using um, a compressed air that you would use it when the grill is off and it's cool. So that oh. you're just blowing it on there and then it turns into flames. Yes, yes ma'am. And here again, once all that stuff, you get all that cleaned out, you can go back and use the shop back and suck all that right out of there. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for that. That's uh, a, yeah. that's important to know. What about uh, homemade products instead of regular cleaning chemicals? Homemade products that you would recommend for cleaning? Well, the, you know, the vinegar and the, um, the baking soda is, is one of the biggest ones that, that I've used. Now, as far as um, the, like the grill grates themselves, you can mm -hmm. take an onion and cut it in half, or you can take a lemon and cut it in half and, you know, have that grill grate hot, but um, hold on to it with your tongs and just wipe back and forth across there because that onion and the lemon both are going to have some acidic value to them and they'll help. That's a natural product that you could use as well, you know, as the other things we talked about to kind of help scrub and clean the top of those grates off. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Now, lots of people are, are, are building these back patios that have like a, a set in grill where the grill is then set into stone or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for cleaning around those areas where it's not just a, a freestanding barbecue grill? Or a fire yeah. Plant. So um, I had one of those at one time and I had like a little granite slab on both sides of it. And, you know, I just used a regular countertop cleaner for that. Um, the outside of it, of that one was stainless. So you, you could actually use a stainless cleaner on a, on a grill like that. And mine actually had a big wide tray, the width of the, the grill, and you could pull that tray out so you could easily take it out dump it, use a water hose to clean it off with. And um, I, here again, I would probably use a little Dawn on that because mm -hmm. it's not in the cooking component. It's down below catching grease, right? So um, it would be fine to clean that, you know, with, with a soap. But I don't ever put like soap or chemicals inside the grill itself. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Um, and how important is it to have like an outside grill cover that's like a, a it's like parachute material or something where it goes over the top of it to try to keep out rain from from getting the outside of the grill rusty? How important is that? Oh, I, I think it just ensures the longevity of your grill. If you want to invest in a cover, I think it's just going to make your grill last longer and you can get a lot more years and seasons of use out of it. So um you know, I certainly think it's worth the investment to go ahead and get one and 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 try to keep your grill covered when you're not using it. So, all right, let's say that Robbie Schultz is going outside to do a great big weekend grill. What are some of the favorite tips that you recommend as far as just making that a pleasant experience for everybody, um, whether it's cooking, whether it's the cooking ingredients, whether it's the setup of the grill? What do you recommend? Oh, well, you know, um, I love cooking outside. And um, around a, it, whether it be a smoker or a grill or whatever, you know, it's time for me to pop a wheelie and put on my dog and pony show and, uh, <laughs> you know, go out just a little bit. Um, so, you know, I like to say that food has been bringing people together since the beginning of man, you know, because early man, they hunted together and they sat around a campfire together and cooked what they were able to hunt and find. And so, um, it's for me, it's just such an enjoyable experience. I would make sure that I had um, plenty of snacks sitting around the grill, plenty of chairs for people to be comfortable. I would probably um, have some games out there, maybe um, cornhole or something like that. You know, uh, got kids, guys, everybody loves playing cornhole. So have that available in the backyard. 
and just make it an, a fun all around experience for everybody and try to include the kids. You know, we need to try to teach our kids things like this because um, it's a life skill learning how to cook. And um, it's it just brings people together and makes them closer when they can um, all work together to, you know, cook a meal and put things together and all have a good time while the meal's cooking. And uh, Dixie Doodles says that she would also add in cold yeah. beverages. Dixie Doodles, uh, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like not just going out and grilling food to cook the food, but it sounds like you're making an event of it where you're welcoming everyone in and they're playing games and everybody's sitting around and kind of chatting because it takes a few minutes to cook. And right. so not just one person out there cooking and everyone else is inside having fun, but it sounds like you're making a big event of it. Yeah, that's what we do down here in Texas. It's all about getting together and it's all about relationships and um, that, ma making that human connection and everybody just enjoying the day together. And um, I'll tell you what, Angela, we're sure starting to get some pretty weather down here now. And mm -hmm. I, you're making me itch, want to get out there and fire the old <laughs> smoker up outside and have some folks over, you know. Now, what's the difference between a barbecue grill and a smoker? Well, um, a, a barbecue grill could either be charcoal, um, it could be electric, or it could be gas. Now, most of the time, um, smokers nowadays, the type I like to use, of course, they've got all kinds of fancy smokers out there. You know, there's the Pit Bosses, the uh, Traegers, all those brands. And, you know, they're, they've kind of made them. Um, and I, I'm, I think they're really nice, and we own one of them. Um, we don't do a lot with it, but they're pretty much hands free. They make it where we can get kind of lazy and just set the temperature control and make sure you got plenty of pellets in it. And, uh, you know, you can go on and do your own thing. I like a wood burner where I'm having to stay out there with it, keep everybody outside with you. We're constantly feeding it wood throughout the afternoon or the day or whatever. Depends on what meat we're, we're cooking and smoking. Um, but you know, that's my kind of cooking right there. I like to, I like that uh, old wood burner, that little more old fashioned. The um, the wood box, it's, it's a, what we would call, uh, it's indirect heat. The, the wood box is set off to one side and then you have uh, it, the smoke and the heat flow into the pit and then they exit on the other side. Does the food taste different depending on the fuel source? I think so. I think I like burning. Um, I like burning cut, cut wood that we cut ourselves out here on the farm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. But that's All just right. me. that's just me. Um, I I I give um, my brother in law and and his son, my nephew, a hard time because they they have pellet smokers and and I have one too. Okay. Um, but the little pellets they they actually look like chicken feed and i say boys we do this for a living where i'm from we don't use chicken feed to, to smoke with you know I, just, <laughs> I have to ride them pretty high you know you use you use the pellets to feed the chickens and then you use the pellets to cook the chickens I that's hear you. right right <laughs> so what is the difference between pellets and let's say like b barbecue briquettes and then the wood and then the gas, like what, what, as far as temperature goes, does one burn hotter? Is it, is it just a preference? Well, I think, yes, ma'am. I think once you get a wood fire going, it's going to always uh, can be the hottest because you, um, now briquettes, um, you know, you, most of the time you've got to add like a lighter fluid or some, you know, igniter to that to get it going. So some people will argue that, you know, that they that taste remains in there and you can taste it in the burgers or whatever. Um, and I, you know, I, there may be some truth to that. Um, but personally, uh, I like the, the, the wood burning smoker over the pellet and the briquettes, but that's just me. And not everybody um, has access to, to going and cutting a tree down and, you know, getting fresh, you know, or seasoned wood or whatever. Um, and if you want to talk about that, I can give you some tips on what kind of wood we smoke with. That doesn't have yeah, any... tell us that. That would be awesome. Okay. So um, here in East Texas, we have a lot of uh, hickory, post oak, and pecan that is indigenous to this area. And so 
you know, we can use one of the three or depends on what kind of mood we wake up with. And, you know, we may uh, <laughs> use a combination of all three. So I, I guess that there are some I know in my area, people go and they buy logs. Uh -huh. if they don't if they don't have uh, the ability to cut them down or whatever. And I live in the city, so maybe cutting down the trees is not available. Right. So if you were going to go looking for logs, is there a particular type of log that you would look for if you were going to buy a log to go inside the smoker? Yeah, I, I would make sure it was post oak, hickory or pecan. Um, now, up north, I, there's a lot of folks that smoke with fruit wood, like apple, cherry, those kinds of things. I oh, just wow. don't have any experience with that smoking with that kind of wood because we don't have those type of trees down here normally. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, the others, you go out in the woods and find them just about anywhere. So when you cook, and I know you've got lots of recipes and stuff, but when you cook, do you put the seasoning on and marinate the meats before you cook or do you do it as you go or a combination of both? Well, you know, it depends on what it is. Like if it's a brisket or whatever. Yeah, we use a dry rub on that, Angela. And um, it's a topical rub. We make it ourselves right here at Bear Creek and we sell it in a little a little shaker uh, jar. There's no huge secret to it. Um, but we like to share that with people. It's, it's the same thing we use right here in our barbecue restaurant. And it's, it's great. Um, now during the cooking cycle with, um, like on a brisket or whatever ribs, we use the same, uh, rub. And as a matter of fact, on ribs that we do the brisket, uh, mm. we, we will spray a little bit of, um, apple juice on, on those meats as they smoke. So, um, to try to help keep them moist and that sort of thing. And what does the apple juice do other than keeping it moist? Does it, does it add you know, flavor? It's, Is it's, it, 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 it will add a little bit of flavor and I think it helps create the, maybe a little bit of that bark on the outside. Um, ah. And, but it, it will help keep the product moist while you're the meat moist while you're smoking and cooking it. Yeah. Well, and that's important because I know that uh, me, <clears throat> me specifically, since I don't know much about cooking, especially grilling, um, the meat is either overcooked or it's tough or it's just not, and I, I'm just no good at it. So how do you keep the meat tender while you're cooking? Is there, is there, are there any tricks besides the apple juice? Uh, yes, ma'am, there is. Uh, be prepared to, to have plenty of time on hand and don't, don't rush it, Angela. Um, it's better to cook at a lower temperature and go way longer. And, um, it, it will, that will help guarantee that your brisket doesn't turn out like a new pair of cowboy boots. Oh, I think that's my problem because I yeah. always turn it as high as it goes. I cook it as fast as I possibly can cook it. Yeah. And Don't like, rush it. Okay. Don't rush it. You've always heard the barbecue people say low and slow. And we've been saying that for years. So low and slow. So that, that there is my mistake because I've, I've blown that every time I've tried to cook. So and then uh -huh. I gave up on it because I didn't, I didn't, uh, uh -huh. I didn't do it the right way. Yeah. Um, Angela, take your time, get the cornhole out there. Get some <laughs> um, have, have your friends over, take your time. Life is too short. Life is too short. All righty. Um, okay. So let's suppose that there's somebody, maybe me, not not skilled at um, grilling, but I'm now I'm now confident that I can clean up when I'm done. What would you recommend as far as learning or training? How do I how do I learn how to use my barbecue grill? Well, you know what? There is a wealth of knowledge on Google and and all the different websites that are out there. I would suggest just um, at night sit around and, you know, do some research. And then, um, you know, when you get brave enough, try to go out in the backyard and implement what you've learned, you know, by doing some research and trying to mm -hmm. implement some of those recipes or techniques or whatever you may have found out. But um, Angela, you can do it. You think so? Yeah, you can do it. <laughs> it's, it's not hard. So uh, if I don't have, and here's the catch because I'm moving right now and I've already given my barbecue grill away. So as I move to my new house, I've got to get a new one. Yeah. And so do I, do I get one of those like little green egg things? Do I get like a regular barbecue grill? Do I get a smoker? Like what, what if I was going to invest in something and I was going to learn how to do it? What is the, the, the starter 
the starter kit for someone like myself? <laughs> the, the starter kit, the probably the simplest and the most inexpensive would be just like a little charcoal uh, unit, you know, that you can go and buy charcoal put in there. And um, uh, it'll do just about anything you, you want to as far as smaller muscle meats, hamburgers, um, dogs, all that hot dogs, all that kind of stuff. Um, it would be pretty tough to try to do a huge um, brisket or something like that on there. But, you know, if, if you have a small family, I, I really suggest just a, a small um, briquette, you know, cooker. Awesome. Well, that may be where I start. I know that we went out and we bought a really nice grill. And uh, I, I don't know that we ever really learned how to use it. it had like you didn't use pot. it that much? No, it had like a built-in pot in it so you could make corn on the cob. And it had like all kinds of special things in there. And you could roast like a rotisserie chicken. And yeah. it, it promised all these things. And I think I fell in love with the pictures that were on the on the ad. Like, oh, hey, I think I see myself doing that. And I, I yeah. didn't really utilize any of the features very well. Yeah. So, well, it, it sounds like you don't need a whole lot then. So I, I think the small little charcoal grill would do you just right. You know, it, it's not going to have any bells and whistles or anything. But um, if you're not going to be using it a lot or cooking huge meals out there or whatever, it, it probably worked perfectly. Got it. Well, yeah. and then the, the uh, interesting thing was because I was I, and I'd used it a couple of times, cranked it up to full heat and then cooked it too fast and ended up with, what did you say? Cowboy boots? <laughs> yeah. It'll turn it into boot leather pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> then it wasn't, it wasn't memorable enough to try it again. Right. So I don't yeah. think I really got the full use out of it. Um, right. tell, me, tell me how to store the propane tanks. Cause I'm guessing you don't store them inside the unit during the winter time or do you? Um, most time you can leave them hooked up if you want to. I would make sure that the gas is turned off. Make sure that it is turned off for the winter because um, nine times out of 10, you, you may have just a small, small leak in a gas line or whatever, and you'll drain your bottle. And, you know, those bottles are expensive when you go get them filled up. So mm. uh, to protect that, make sure it's turned off. And you could even unhook it, unhook the gas line, but just leave it right sitting right where it is and it'll be fine all winter long. Okay. And if I'm not using gas, if I'm using wood burning and it's the, the wood that you mentioned, um, how would I, what, how would I clean that out in time for the winter time? Well, um, you just open the door on it and you would have a little flat shovel and that's where your five gallon metal buckets going to come in. You just dip those ashes right out, put them in the bucket. And, um, you know, if you'd been smoking any time within the last day or two, I would let those ashes sit in the, that metal bucket. There's no danger of it catching anything on fire for a couple of days before you dump them out um, to avoid a, uh, an unwanted fire or whatever. You um, you can actually take those ashes and you can put them like in your flower bed or on your, your lawn or whatever. It's pot ash is what it is. And um Anyway, so it can be useful there in the in the yard as well. And that was my next question. Compost? That yeah, that was my next question. Is it compostable yeah. or do you have to discard of it in some special way? Yeah. Yeah. But I yeah. love I, I love that for the pots and the plants because unlike um, what I did, I used a, a juicer and then when the pulp came out from my carrots and stuff, I put it around my plants for compost and it attracted a whole bunch of deer and uh, bunny rabbits. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> and I think they ate my plants. I think the, uh, the pot ash would not do that. So that might be, yeah, no, it won't. <laughs> that might be a better solution. So right. tell me of all the things that you, uh, you grill, what is one of your favorite recipes for grilling? What do you enjoy most? Um, you know what? I think, and I want to share this with you because I think pork butts are probably one of the most forgiving cuts of meat mm -hmm. and you can, you can do so many things out of it. That's, it, that's the cut that most people use barbecue houses use for pulled pork and you're in the Carolinas. So you got to try this. Um, we just, we put our brisket and rib rub on the, on the pork butts, put them on the, um, because the, they have a good, amount of fat content to it, a layer mm -hmm. of fat around it. And that's what helps keep that meat moist and makes it a little more forgiving during the cooking process. And um, it won't like <laughs> turn into boots so quick with you, like uh, a rack of ribs or brisket or whatever. 
But um, that's that's one of my favorite things to do. Now, up there in the Carolinas, I think y'all use a little bit different sauce than we do down here in Texas. But once that um, pork butt gets ready, you'll be able to take the bone on the side of it and you'll be able to just slide it right out. You'll know that it's perfectly done and tender. And uh, you take it out, we fork it up and we put our tomato based barbecue sauce on it. I think you guys, do y'all do a vinegar and mustard base? In Carolina, we, we we do use a lot of vinegar in our in our barbecue sauces here in the Carolinas. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm I'm not real familiar with that, but um, the pulled pork is one of my favorite things to cook because it it's so easy. If you you know if you needed to run an errand while that pork butt is on there smoking, you could probably get away with being away for an hour or something and come back, and you're still going to be just fine. And this is where you're talking about cooking it slow. On low heat, cooking it slow, letting it kind of simmer and, and do its thing. Yes, ma'am. I, I like to cook at around 225 to 250, just for those out there who are wondering. And about how long do you cook it? Well, as far as ribs go, we'll do ribs for about four hours. Briskets can take 15 to hours plus or minus, just depending on how big they are. Pork butts, probably a good um, six to eight hours, something like that on pork butts depending on how big they are too. And so um, I'm guessing the preparation for all of this stuff is going to also require some sort of cleanup. What is the preparation cleanup that you do um, for all of the, getting the rub ready, getting the stuff ready, putting it in the, you're going to have dishes or trays or what? Yeah. You know, you know what, um, Angela, what I like to do, I like to actually get a big food service pan there. You can get them at the dollar store, wherever, they're what we use to serve when we're doing big caterings, but they'll hold a brisket, pork butt, racks of ribs or whatever. I like to use one of those because they've got sides on it, you know, about mm -hmm. three inches tall. So you can just take your brisket and rib rub and just shake it all over there. You've got that, you know, the raw meat juice that's in there. So you're not, you're either going to want to wash that out or I just throw them away and there's no mm -hmm. cleanup at all. Oh, wow. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. What a great, what a great tip. And these yeah. are the, these are the big thicker pans that you would see like that you might put a turkey in for Thanksgiving or something that you find at the, at the yes, Dollar Tree. Yes, Got it. Yep. So you use that for the preparation and then you, you then uh, put your meat in it when it's done or no? Usually, um, usually I don't, but I tell you what, that it, it does sound kind of wasteful just throwing those away after one use. You could just rinse them out with some hot water. Um, I wouldn't even put any soap in it. I just rinse them out with hot water. If you want to use that to put your brisket, your ribs or pork butts right back into. Well, that's awesome. Oh yeah. All right. So what about uh, wiping down the counters if it has meat on it? How, how do you clean that area? Well, I would, I would use something that, um, you know, some type of disinfectant or whatever, um, just wipe it down. I like those, um, little wipes that come right out of the thing. You know, the, I can't remember the name of why maybe Lysol brand. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just wipe the counters down with something like that. And that's, that's all you got to do. Chicken is the worst. That's the one that you really got to make sure that you clean up good afterwards on, you know? And why is that? Well, it's just the, the different germs and bugs and bacteria that chicken can host. And um, I think I think more so can be a little more so uh, dangerous to us than, say, beef or pork, possibly. And we're told the same thing about uh, egg whites. If you get egg whites on your counters, they say wipe it up, you know, clean it with a, a disinfectant, wipe it with a paper towel and stuff. And don't use a sponge because sponges can hold bacteria and stuff like yeah. that in it. So I'm yeah. guessing that's the same for the meats that we are cooking with to make yeah. sure that we're wiping that up with a disinfectant and making sure we're not cross contaminating our cleaning supplies. And then maybe a cloth or, a, I don't know, a drying towel or whatever you have that's inside your kitchen, making sure that they don't come in contact. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you just wipe it down with a paper towel, you're just, I mean, you're just smearing it across there. It's not really clean. I mean, you wipe yeah any uh, liquid or juice that might be there, but you're not really cleaning it. You know, that's why you mm -hmm. need to run that Lysol wipe over there. Got it. Well, is there anything that I forgot to ask that you would want to share with us that might be insightful um, in preparing for our next, our next big barbecue? Wow. Um, I would say just, 
you know, pick your meat ahead of time, whatever you feel like you're going to be comfortable with. Um, the, depending on what size crowd you want to invite over or whatever, if you wanted to tackle a brisket, you better make sure you got all day to play with it, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's going to take a while. Um, probably the quickest things to do would be burgers or hot dogs. Hot dogs are, you know, hot dogs are ready to eat right out of the package. So if you want something pretty effortless, I would I would go with hot dogs. Um, patties would be the next step up, hamburger patties. Um, and you can either make those yourself or buy them already preformed, season them however you want to. Um, you can get those done, you know, in 30 minutes to an hour, just depending on what type of unit you have that you're cooking with. Um, and then like I, ribs are so easy to do. And um, if you if you'll cook those ribs at about 225 to 250, just right in that range. Um, and if you go under or over that, it, you know, it's, you're not you're not going to mess them up. But that's just the range I like to stay in. But those ribs you can have done in about four hours. So it just depends on how much time you have. Plan your meal around that and your guests and all your outdoor activities and have a good time. Enjoy each other. So if you have guests that are coming in the afternoon, do you schedule when they're coming and when you plan on eating around when the food is going to be cooked or do you try to cook it a day in advance or what is the process I would, there? I wouldn't cook a day in advance. I'd do it out there and make it an event for everybody to enjoy, you know, and enjoy the great outdoors, get some fresh air, enjoy your backyard or your side yard or front yard, whatever you got. And uh, just make it something that everybody can have a good time all the way from the kids up to the adults and the adults know how to have fun. Right. I love that. That's <laughs> so, so exciting. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm now rethinking this whole barbecue thing. I'm thinking that maybe it's possible that I could do this and then certainly we can clean up when we're done. Oh um, yeah. So you're, you're thinking bells and whistles now, aren't you? You're going back. No. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm hallucinating about the family event and everybody playing cornholes or Frisbee or flying a kite yeah. or something like that. And yeah. just spending time together outside. Yeah. Um, what, one other thing you mentioned when you were talking about the, the pulled pork and you said that in the Carolinas, we have a different recipe is the recipe that you use available inside your general store. Oh yeah. We sell the brisket and rib rub in here. Yeah. You can order it online. You can get it in the general store. And um, I would like if any of your viewers are happen to be coming through Texas, we would love to have you come by the general store. Um, you're going to have a great time. You're going to eat some great barbecue. We've got great shopping, a great environment. It's, it's an experience in itself. So we would welcome you and uh, like just like a family member. Well, it sounds like so much fun. I, I can't wait. I've got to come to Marshall, Texas, and I got to come visit you. Um, tell our listeners where they can go to find you. Yeah. So um, we have a website, bearcreeksmokehouse.com. You can find all of our products on there, including the cookbook. Um, you can follow us on Facebook. And I would encourage you, if you're watching, to follow us on Facebook or Instagram. It's Bear Creek Smokehouse. And um, you can keep up with all the latest and greatest things that are happening out here in the country at Bear Creek. Well, I really appreciate your time today. I have learned so much about your insights into grilling and you gave me the confidence to think that I might make another effort at grilling. <laughs> because on, instead of you just, can do it. I've got confidence in you, girl. Instead <laughs> of just cleaning the barbecue grill, now I actually want to go out there and I want to try to cook. So what I might do is I might uh, take some before and after pictures and then show you my attempts at cooking and see if... Uh, yeah, see if this is uh, something that I could actually participate in. I'm sure you can do it. I, I've got all the confidence in the world in you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. You I really appreciate it because there's a, there's a lot about the barbecue grill that many of us, because we haven't really known how to clean it and we haven't known how to set up for it, we haven't known how to prepare for it, that it has been an elusive thing to us and we've kind of avoided it. So I'm hoping that because you came on our show today that you've given us the confidence that we might attempt this one more time and then also be able to clean, keep our grill sanitary, and that we have a really good, enjoyable experience this spring with our families. So thank you. You betcha. Thank you. I hope you all have a great summer and I hope you have it filled with lots of get togethers and barbecues. Thank you so much. We'll see you.